Welcome back to Otaku Daikun. Dai here, and for this video we have a special guest. It's JRPG. Hi guys, JRPG here. Otaku Daikun has been awesome enough to talk with me about some frustrating JRPG stuff and some awesome JRPG stuff, and that's mainly what you're going to find on my channel. It's JRPGs, Japanese games, there's some Western games and card games in there as well, and I sometimes enjoy those, but things you'll find are like facts and histories and games you might have missed where I highlight an older game, launch day reviews for all the latest and greatest Japanese games, and all that kind of stuff. I also drink copious amounts of tea and do a series called JRPT Time on the weekends where I talk about something in the industry and make some tea. Alright guys, without further ado, here is the video and I'll see you all soon. It's my very first collab and I'm proud to have him on board. You can find his channel in the description below and at the end of this video. Also, be sure to check out this video's companion piece on his channel where we talk about some of our favorite JRPG mechanics. For this video, however, we'll be diving into what the two of us consider to be some of the most frustrating mechanics in JRPGs. Now, JRPGs, as much as I love them, all seem to have their ups and downs. Each one has a boatload of elements ranging from story, characters, sound, combat, and exploration. Most RPGs nail the majority of these elements, but often mess up with at least one. And that's what we're gonna talk about here. We've each selected three frustrating mechanics that show up in JRPGs to present to you. Let the rage begin. Temporary party members. I'm honestly quite sick and tired of losing party members in JRPGs due to story reasons. I could handle Aerith in Final Fantasy VII, but losing Alicia in Tales of Zestiria really bugged me. If someone joins my party in an RPG, I expect them to stay for the long haul. The straw that broke the camel's back for me was in Xenogears. Ellie is my favorite character, and she'd been in my main party for practically the entire game. Then, right before the final dungeon, she winds up staying behind to fulfill her duty as a public figure. If you didn't know that was coming, you'd have to level up a replacement party member practically from scratch, since experience isn't shared among reserve characters. Grandia games are notorious for dropping party members like flies. It really takes the fun out of leveling characters up knowing they're basically only a guest character, and they're eventually going to stay behind. Usually, the reasons why the characters leave the party are pretty lame. Useless spells are something that annoy me less now than they did when I was a kid, but the problem still remains, even if I can almost avoid them in my elder self-wisdom. When I say useless spells, I'm referring to two things. Abilities that are literally useless in that they do nothing or their effect is a negative, and also abilities that seem to be good by their descriptions but are either inferior versions of pre-existing abilities or just plain suck. Final Fantasy IX has both kinds, so it's easy for me to reference that here, and it's also my favourite game of all time, so I like talking about it. But anyway, in the beginning of the game you infiltrate a stage show and quote unquote act in the play. While doing this though, you do actually get into battles and you do need to win them. But since it's still part of the play that people are watching, you get a list of spells for each character which sound awesome. Right up until you use them and it does zero damage and then you use them again, thinking it's just some kind of chance-based thing or perhaps an instant death spell, but nope, just zero damage. See, the reason they are there are purely for story reasons. The spells are listed as SFX, or in other words, special effects. They are merely special effects for the play, but are completely useless. It doesn't make sense for them to be included because all it did to me when I was a kid was get me killed. Final Fantasy IX also has a blue mage character. This archetype is named many different things across many different games, but the gist is that they can learn the spells and abilities of enemies using some kind of copy mechanic. The problem with this is that almost every ability you can learn is useless, because they are mostly all just worse versions of other spells you already have access to. It's a big time sink to collect all 100-ish spells when there are about three you can actually use. The Double Standard I also call this one the fuck chain. Let's say you run into a boss you just can't beat. In order to win, you need something stronger, like a new sword. Turns out, the only enemies that drop the sword you need are either equally strong or stronger than the boss you're stuck on. Essentially, if you were strong enough to obtain the sword, you wouldn't need it in the first place. This is pretty damn common in Monster Hunter style games and MMOs, but first hit me right in the sack in Final Fantasy VIII. 
I'll admit, I wasn't keen on all the mechanics, and I only made it far enough in-game because I spammed summons. But eventually, in Final Fantasy VIII, you'll encounter Adele. A boss right before the final dungeon. Turns out you've got to kill him quick, without area of effect skills, or else you'll kill Rinoa and get a game over. For me, it was like hitting a brick wall. The only way out was for me to draw a bunch of Aura Magic, a spell that makes limit breaks more common. Problem is, you can only find these spells by harvesting the borders of the islands closest to heaven and hell. Even worse, the encounter rate on those islands is constant, and all the enemies there are at level 100. In order to beat the boss, I'd have to beat enemies even harder than that boss, making the point pretty damn moot. I really despise this mechanic, whether it be by literally forcing you to put certain characters in your party at certain times, or whether they force you to use a certain character because the boss or section wouldn't be doable if you didn't use them. I hate it. I like to use the characters I like, and it's really poor game design to force a character to be used instead of simply making the player want to use them. The first thing that comes to mind when I think about this mechanic is Colette in Tales of Symphonia. I'm not a big fan of Colette, and she is downright awful in combat for most of the game, but the game forces her into your party constantly due to story reasons. This always seems to happen right before a boss fight, and it's obscene because it feels like intentional handicapping of the player. There are far better options for your party, but you are forced to use this subpar character in some of the toughest fights the game has to offer. Whenever a character is forced on me, I always think to myself, why couldn't they have just made this character good? I would have already been using them if they were good. Unskippable cutscenes. Okay, I love me some JRPG cutscenes. I actually like how Xenosaga Episode 1 was practically a movie. Still, in the rare occasion that a boss kicks your ass and you're forced to reload from a previous save, it's a wonderful thing to be able to skip cutscenes you've already seen. This normally wouldn't bother me that much, but holy crap, it would have made all the difference in Star Ocean The Second Evolution. Unless you've prepared yourself thoroughly with knowledge of this guy's difficulty, you'll likely get run over by Gabriel, the final boss. While I appreciate the gorgeous anime cutscene that precedes the battle, Seeing it well over 20 times is enough to drive anyone nuts. Essentially, the last thing I want to do after getting killed by a cheap-ass boss is to let my adrenaline settle over a frustrating cooldown. I truly commend anyone else who's beaten this guy, especially without his limiter. This one takes a bit of explaining. What do I mean by hidden super mechanics? Well, what I'm talking about is a combination of items, mechanics, and or strategies that are intentionally put into the game knowing that when the right combination is used, they offer a huge advantage in some way. And more often than not, the post game is balanced around it despite the game never explicitly explaining how to perform the feat. A perfect example of this is in Tales of Zestiria. If you want to 100% the game, or get the Platinum Trophy, or get the most out of a New Game Plus second playthrough, you need to max out all the levels on a number of NPCs called the Lords of the Land. The way you do this is by offering them items, but the amount needed is simply insane. The only way you can possibly do it is by buying items, and the only way you can afford to buy the amount you need to max them all is by utilizing a hidden super mechanic to get lots and lots of gold. Here's the combination of things that go into making this work. 1. There is an item in the game you can use during a battle to increase the gold earned at the end. 2. Reaching a certain level on the Lords of the Land allows you to buy a skill that regenerates the chests in that region over time. 3. There is a small chance when looting a chest that a monster will come out instead. And 4. One of the chest monsters is a golem that drops a lot of gold. So what you need to do is get certain Lords of the Land with the most convenient chess locations up to a certain level. Set the skill that regenerates chess. Then buy as many of the items that increase gold earned as you can. Then you need to fast travel between regions to the quickest chess locations and hope that one of them spawns a golem. Then you need to use all of the gold increasing items in battle and keep in mind there is a 15 second cooldown on items so for several minutes you are just running around avoiding being hit. Then you finally kill the golem and earn 1.5 million gold. You can then use this to start increasing Lords of the Land, but you'll have to do this many, many more times to have enough resources to max them all. It's obvious the game is balanced around this because it would be near impossible to max all the Lords of the Land in other ways. And this is just one of the hidden super mechanics out there, but it's enough to make me hate the way these things are implemented. I guess they wouldn't be so bad if it weren't obvious that the games were balanced around the player using them. There are much better ways to encourage exploration and experimentation in JRPGs. 
So there you have it. Six different mechanics in JRPGs that rear their ugly heads, even in the best of games. Have you run into any of these? Are there other mechanics that just itch you the wrong way? Please mention them in the comments below, and be sure to check out JRPG's channel if you're looking for consistent coverage of the latest and greatest RPGs coming out in Japan and the world over. As always, be sure to like this video and subscribe to Otaku Daikun for more anime lists, reviews, discussions, recommendations, analyses, and let's plays. Until the next video, celebrate your fandom!